ones. <laughs> okay, well, welcome to the Telehealth Titans group. This is going to be my favorite panel of the day because I know these characters pretty well and I promise we're going to have fun. Uh, so the way we're going to run today, you know, introductions from each of you and who you're affiliated with, and I will ask you the really tough questions about the future of digital health and telehealth because at 4.30 I'm supposed to give the closing keynote with the answer. So you got to help me here. <laughs> so Mike, please go ahead. Uh, quick, quick background? Okay. Yeah. So Mike Baird, I'm president of Customer Solutions at American Well. I work very closely with Roy. I, I run the health system side of our portfolio. I was previously the CEO of Avizia. So most of my focus has been on the acute care side of telehealth. Excellent. Wow. Uh, Lyle Berkowitz, I'm the chief medical officer. Of Avizia. I, I don't know if your mic may be oh. pointed oh. in the wrong direction. It's got to be turned on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And turn right. your mic up. Yeah, and turn it up? You know, the, uh, your mic is horizontal, not vertical. See, this is where the... Okay. Yeah. Everyone Good. hear me? Okay. Um, so my name is Lyle Berkowitz. I'm the Chief Medical Officer at MD Live and the President of MD Live's Medical Group. I'm an internist, primary care by background. I worked uh, much of my career at Northwestern Medicine in Chicago, uh, a large academic medical center. Uh, where I did practice as well as had Escalade and physician executive roles in the informatics and eventually on the innovation side. Uh, been with MD Live for almost two years now, um, focused more on the outpatient uh, perspective. You know, we do um, you know, a, a lot of urgent care, telehealth uh, visits, uh, but you'll be hearing we're expanding uh, beyond that um, in a variety of primary care ways as well as deliver behavioral health, dermatology, et cetera, at, uh, um, to, to the nation. John Karangi, um, CEO for CareClix. Uh, my background, I'm a radiologist, I'm a neuroradiologist, been involved with you know, telehealth for probably 20 plus years. Uh, grew up in the teleradiology world and then uh, founded CareClix a few years back and, and we've been doing uh, you know, various types of telehealth type services as well as technology um, for different organizations. Terrific. Hi everyone, <clears throat> I'm Roy Schoenberg, I'm CEO of American Well. Um, had the pleasure to be uh, across the office from John about 25 years ago or so. When yeah, we were he's, a, he's actually done better financially than me. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to tell, but, yeah. the, the, but been in telehealth pretty much ever since. Um, American Well is a, a, a telehealth organization based in Boston that's providing a lot of different types of telehealth services, primarily as an infrastructure for a lot of the usual suspects of healthcare, whether these are the pairs that I think everybody is familiar with or the health systems. Um, pretty much kind of spread evenly between consumer-oriented telehealth and clinical acute telehealth, and just looking forward to the conversation. Well, great. Why don't I start off with just even asking what is telehealth, right? Because telehealth has so many definitions, and let me just point this out. So I do 900 telemedicine consultations a year myself. Now, how would I possibly do that? So I am the nation's expert on poisonous mushrooms and plants, very bizarre. Mm -hmm. And so every poison control center in the United States, when they have an ingestion, contacts me. And what is a telehealth consultation? They send me a photograph of a half-eaten mushroom <laughs> and say, what is this and will the child die? And the answer is most of the time the kids are fine. It's the adults with the Audubon Field Guide. You gotta watch those. <laughs> uh, and so how does this work from a me mechanistic or billing standpoint? Well, Harvard malpractice insures me for a telehealth practice, and I am credentialed by a group of my peers yearly as to uh, am I competent in de delivering this telehealth service. So this is not just me in a casual fashion picking up the phone, it's there is a record with a photograph, there is credentialing and there is malpractice insurance, but it's store and forward, it's not, I'm not doing FaceTime telepresence or any of the things you might think of our real-time video chat. And that's a kind of telehealth. Another quick kind of telehealth. I don't know if any of you heard that uh, about a week and a half ago, I had a syncopal episode while at a conference. Don't worry, I'm not gonna faint on you. Um, this, I was at Health Catalyst. I was in a room with 20 people that had capacity maximum of 10. We had no fluids of any kind. It was really hot and I hadn't slept in two days. I stood up and I fainted. And of course, I was wearing a prototype, an engineering sample of a continuous ECG monitor 
were we there then able to send a continuous ECG tracing to the head of electrophysiology at Harvard and say, so can you look at this? And he said, oh, it was a vasovagal faint. It was just a nothing. Don't worry about it. And that was a kind of telehealth, Internet of Things of a device I was wearing, and everything in between. So maybe we'll start with Roy. Maybe you can comment on, so American Well, you know, what do you think is the scope of your practice? So first of all, I want to... <clears throat> We reserve the right, Mike and me, to have completely different opinions about this. <laughs> um, I think, you know, we've been searching for the definition for quite some time because over the last 12 years of our existence, this industry, this area of industry has morphed completely. Um, I think the one that currently, to me, spells out or explains telehealth the best way is it's the delivery of care over technology, which is a little bit kind of maybe simplistic, maybe kind of pithy, maybe high level. But at the end of the day, it essentially means that uh, an industry that has been, you know, for many, many decades, been perceived as something that is brick and mortar based, that is, you have to go to healthcare wherever you need it, is now fueled by the notion that technology can project its skills. It doesn't actually specify whether the projection of skills is mushroom knowledge or whether it is you know, an EKG, but the notion that the resources of healthcare, that the skills of healthcare, that the inventory of goods of healthcare, which are primarily clinicians, but not only, can be projected over technology to wherever there is a need, is a concept that has transformed retail. It's a concept that transformed media. It's a concept that transformed banking. I just think that we are, you know, our glacial industry has arrived to the point that this is actually transforming healthcare. But that's it, it's a very simple definition. Okay, so there you heard, it's technology-enabled healthcare writ large. Mm -hmm. <laughs> John. Yeah, I, I oftentimes tell people when I, when I say, what's telehealth? I just tell them, you know, it's, it's just healthcare. And a lot of people have said this before, but I, I see telehealth kind of just as a word that's kind of come and it's gonna disappear as this sort of, like I always said, technology sort of gets into embedded within healthcare delivery models and, uh, and now you're going to have different mediums where people see patients, uh, whether they're inpatients, outpatients, and now these virtual consults, whatever you want to call them, but ultimately it's going to be all one unit of ways of delivering healthcare. So I think that term will kind of disappear as time goes on a little bit, as people become more comfortable with, with delivering those sorts of care. So, so John raises this really important point that I think is probably true, which is this morning when you were on Amazon, did you say, honey, I'm doing e-commerce right now. <laughs> no, I'm buying things. <laughs> we don't use these terms anymore. You know, e-banking, e com it's just banking. <laughs> Lyle. So I'm not going to add the definitions are spot on. We all agree. I, I think what's more interesting is, is how we're applying it, right? It's, it's a tool. Just like you say EMR is a tool and so much technology is, is a tool. So I think the, the shift I know that you know, we're thinking about now at MD Live particularly is what problem are we solving with this tool and these, this parade of tools? Uh, and I think uh, in, in many people's minds, you know, when you hear telehealth, you think, oh, you're trying to sort of duplicate a 15 minute office visit with a 15 minute video visit. And there's some goodness to that. You know, that, sure. that solves a problem of access, et cetera, but it's not really scalable, it's not really disruptive. So you know, one of the things when I came in was said, let's shift our mindset of what problem are we solving? Problem we're solving should be how do we take care of a medical problem as quickly, easily, cheaply, and high quality as possible using whatever technology we have, video, phone, asynchronous, store and forward, remote patient monitoring, et cetera, because that just opens up a whole nother you know, you know, process of what we can do because uh, otherwise, you know, all we're gonna do is, all, if all we're doing is sort of virtualizing the current model, that's not scalable, it's not gonna help our, our healthcare system. It would, it would be like your Amazon example right. of uh, going on to Amazon or the bank and doing a, saying, hey, I've got a bookseller uh, that I can do a video conference with uh, in, in, <laughs> who's in Seattle and he can help me find a book. That's, that's not scalable, that's not gonna work. Automation and self-service uh, is the same components we need to bring into telehealth. 
right? And so, you know, what he said makes certainly great sense. And as we think about the platform, and I'm not here to criticize any company or service, don't, and it's none of you guys, don't worry. But some years ago, Cisco said, we're going to create a big multi-million dollar kiosk, and it's going to have three-dimensional radar and every single, and, and you just walk into the kiosk and do your thing. And of course, that didn't work out so totally well. <laughs> so to his point of, we were thinking back then of digitizing an existent physical office visit, kind of like a med medical record was digitizing the paper, as opposed to, let's redesign the workflow to do what you need. And, and since I'm in Israel a lot, you know, um, I think I was talking to Phyllis there a few weeks ago. Uh, there is a company, again, not endorsing any product or service, called TitoCare mm -hmm. uh, that you probably work with. And their idea is, don't you hate going to the pediatrician's office with your kid because then they're getting coughed on by every other kid in the waiting room? What if we could give, for under 100 bucks, parents a kit mm -hmm. that you could then use for a telemedicine consultation? And whether it's with you or you or any of you, it's just, they got the kit. And they can do the tympanic membrane photograph without having medical expertise. And that's solving a business problem with a piece of technology. Okay, you said you were going to argue. I, let's see it. Let's see it. <laughs> it's hard to argue with all these great answers. Yeah. Uh, I will note that I was at Cisco during that time and uh, helped with that healthcare group. But uh, I think there was a passionate article over the weekend, I think from the CEO of Tenant, where he said, I've banned the use of the word telehealth in my organization where it's just health. And I actually laughed a little bit because people like Roy have been saying that for at least five years, right? And the reality is, is medicine has always evolved from, you know, hands-on touching to stethoscopes to, uh, you know, uh, uh, an otoscope or whatever it may be. And this is just a, a broader spectrum of tools that can be used. And it comes down to, in every single use case, use the best tools. We've shown in some use cases, like behavioral health, that patients are much more honest on a video visit than they are in person. Uh, we've seen things like a colonoscopy where you would never dream of doing that over telehealth. So the reality is we've got a wide range of, of tools that are available for physicians and other providers to use to do the best things for their patients. And that's really the, the spectrum that we play in. In many respects, it is technology enabled, uh, but we're just here to help patients. And I think if you look at, on our platform, we've got over 150 different use cases that are as broad as you could imagine uh, for delivering care, and physicians will use their good judgment to do that in the best way possible. Excellent. And so he makes an important point about how telehealth actually might lead to a better uh, and more honest history or data. And so let me give you an example. So Brian, I look at you and say, how much do you drink? Mm -hmm. You know, did you just see, whoops, oh my God, I brought failure. Uh, in doing that, there was a human to human interaction and it was a judgment. And he's going to say, oh, me? Uh, you know, I had one beer last week. Whereas, and I tell you this example not because I know Brian, but because Beth Israel Deaconess, 30 years ago when Warner Slack first started doing this on the Link One computer, found that patients on average, when they had a telehealth interaction, reported double the number of drinks every day because there wasn't a judgment associated with providing data. So I think that's really interesting. Okay, so here's a controversial question for the group. So as I said, I was in Amsterdam two days ago with 250 hospital CEOs from 40 countries. And what was the theme? This happened to be the Siemens Health and Ears Conference, but what was the major theme? These hospital CEOs said in five to 10 years, you know, who knows what the number is, the function of a hospital is going to be very different than heads and beds in a brick building. In fact, it's probably going to be we're your care traffic controller. You know, that is you subscribe to our service and then we figure out where you should get the best quality, lowest cost, right setting of care. And we may contract some of that out and some of it may be internal providers or who knows, external providers. So, so I'm gonna start with Roy and ask him this controversial question. These hospital CEOs are worried, and it's an existential worry, about all these giant brick buildings that they put billions of dollars to. When do you think we're going to start to see the transformation? And maybe the answer is William Gibson told us. It's already here. It's just unequally distributed. Well, I think the, uh, the, credit, goes to, the, the credit probably goes to uh, Clay Christensen, right? I mean, he, he said this 20-something years ago where he talked about <clears throat> the 
needle moving change in healthcare is not going to be this technology or the other, it's going to be technologies that lower the care setting that is needed for any specific kind of care and lower the skill set of clinicians that are needed to actually deliver it, which essentially means patients moving out of the hospitals into the outpatient clinic, outpatient to community practices, and very importantly, the lowest cost care setting, which is the home, which also happens to be the most humane place we want to be at the end of the day. And we all know that the, you know, the whole notion of graceful aging and all that is, is, is huge. Um, I think they're worried about it. I think we actually here we have a lot of health system clients who are actively um, incorporating the notion of projecting their services and creating telehealth-based products out of the services that they're very good at, which is a kind of a digital equivalence concept where they say, when we think about our five-year plan, it's not going to be about whether we open up another service line, everything that we're going to do is going to have a physical and a digital counterpart. And that's the way that our organization is going to grow, assuming that somewhere along the line, state licensure is going to either relax or, or be more manageable uh, in terms of insurance coverage so that they can project the services. And we have a couple of examples, you know, Cleveland Clinic, Intermountain, some of those have done a better job than others in kind of reinventing themselves. I think the part that's going to help that um, is that change about Medicare, you know, newly uh, kind of uh, new coverage to, to telehealth that's beginning January 1st for Medicare Advantage, but that's, right. that's a start. At the end of the day, we don't get me wrong, we're not complaining about how we use telehealth to care for the flu and the, you know, stomach ache and all that kind of stuff, all of these kind of urgent care pieces that are still the biggest volume of telehealth. Mm -hmm. Most of healthcare dollars aren't on the flu. They're on heart failure and cancer and elder patients and frail patients and patients who are uh, challenged from getting out of bed. I think the revolution of telehealth is going to be how do you let those health systems that you mentioned do their magic in the home environment in an effective way? Hmm. And this is, you know, Davida was kind of a little bit of a pioneer in a very different fashion by saying, you know, home dialysis with the right kind of envelope can be applicable for more patients if you use technology. And that has changed, you know, how end-stage renal disease is, is being managed. I think this is what we're going to see with telehealth. We are we're very myopic in the way that we see it today. We think of it as the, hey, you know, here's an app that can allow you to see a doctor. I think we, we're going to be very surprised over the next two or three years as telehealth actually comes to be what it can be. So he's mentioned a really important barrier, and I, remember I practice in 50 states. Yep. And do you know how hard that is? And here's how I do it. Don't worry, this is not a magical, it's not a magical business model that you can steal. It's that the physician who is licensed in a given state does a specialty consult to me using the license in that state. So that I'm not licensed to practice in North Dakota but that physician who's consulting me, here's my advice, takes it or leaves it and it's all okay. But shouldn't it be the case that across the, the pair would need to pay for your time and their time, yeah. which immediately takes the punch out of this model. Yeah, but so shouldn't it be in the future that we have a single framework, even if state laws vary, but a framework by which we could deliver telehealth services across this country? So, John. So, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, the reality of some of these health systems and in general around sort of telehealth virtual delivery is that the payers drive a lot of this, right? So, you know, if the reimbursements aren't there, then none of this will happen. So, as Wayne mentioned, as Medicare is now transforming and starting to pay for some of these Medicare Advantage programs and other sorts of uh, uh, rural monitoring and so forth, as those are being adopted and, and put into place, by the by, the payers, then the technology will follow along and will grow, and and, uh, and 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 those hospital systems will you know will reap benefits as they start putting the virtual health programs together. But otherwise, you know, the technology for a lot of these things have been there, been there for a while, um, but the adoption has been slow. Well, I mean, one is the payer side, but also the on the provider side, um, physicians as a whole uh, grow slowly. They change slowly. They're used to doing things in a certain way, um, and until um, it's forced upon them in many cases, 
they're not going to change the way they're used to doing things. And I think, you know, in, at least in the United States, the payers drive a lot of that. Um, and so as that's tr that now they're seeing the, the benefits of providing virtual care, the cost benefits behind it, and hence you're seeing um, payers, you know, paying for this, and now the adoption happens. So he talks about alignment of incentives and payment. And so uh, at Beth Israel Leahy, where I work, roughly 70% of our contracts are value-based purchasing, risk contracts, some kind of shared savings program. They're not traditional fee for service. So in fact, if I can see a patient in their home, it's actually to our advantage because we really don't want to get more examination rooms and build more real estate and all the rest. So I think you're correct. We'll do it when we're paid for doing it. I'll, I'll try and do this in three points. Um, point number one is Blockbuster. Around 2000, of course, you know, this, they had lots of physical present stores. Uh, Netflix came to them and said, hey, things are going online. They said, no, people want to come into our physical um, buildings. They want to touch and feel and talk, etc. Does that sound like a hospital a little? Yeah. Um, you know, what, are, what can hospitals learn from the point that consumer demand you know, is shifting? Um, point number two um, is uh, many years ago, even a little before our time perhaps, you know, there were, you know, the, the primary care doctor took care of everyone in the hospital um, and then intensivists developed you know, in the 70s and then we saw the rise of hospitalists. And I'd suggest that we're going to see another split between the primary care doctor and outpatient setting. Uh, there's, you know, has to see sort of everything, although urgent care is really started taking the lightweight stuff. But I'd suggest the, the rise of the virtualist as being the type of doctor who does take care of the easy stuff, the flu, the sinus, the, and really the chronic disease that's stable. And even though 5% uh, of patients represent 50% of healthcare costs, 50% of patients, right, represent 3 or 5% of the cost. The issue is how do you load balance that, because those people clog up the system. So I'd suggest that we're further going to see a split of primary care doctors into the virtualists who are going to take care of hyper-convenient care, very scalable care, um, using telehealth, virtual online technologies, and complexologists. We're starting to see that, right, with the Oak Street groups and Shen Meds who are, take, who are having a, a much smaller panel sizes um, but really set up well. And so the hospitals of the future, I think, will remain doing what they're doing, taking care of the really sick people who come in, mm -hmm. but they'll be able to increase their panel size um, by using technology to load balance, and I think we'll see the rise of virtual primary care groups. And the primary care groups and all those buildings they have today, I think will become complexology centers um, who will be taking care of less people, um, but in a more intense way, but then they'll be able to scale around that uh, either using partners or doing it themselves. And so what he said is a trend I actually have heard all over the world, that is, we're going to still have a physical building. It's going to be the emergency department you go to when you're hit by a car, you're stabbed, you have a heart attack, a stroke, you know, that sort of thing. And an ICU tower right next door, which will take care of the sickest of the sick that can't possibly have home health care. You know, maybe uh, they are going to need a... a a level of intensity that could never be moved out of such a place. But other than that, all the ambulatory care stuff and all of the, the simple stuff, it all gets moved into the home. So when, what do you think? When well, is this transformation to, happening? To the point that you heard in Amsterdam, the, the time has already passed and it's actually too late. I think a lot of health systems are operating in an old model and for many of them they have virtual monopolies because of certificates of public need or whatever it may be that take a long, long time to build a new hospital. And so the model that's worked for them to make money has been to all about beds and heads, right? Do a billion dollar building. The reality is that building's gonna take 20 or 30 years to get an ROI. And if you were to look 20 or 30 years, I think there's some virtual certainty around the trends of value, uh, certainly the trends around reimbursement. And if I were to fast forward 20 years in the future and think where those care dollars are, what's going to save a chronic disease patient or someone that's on dialysis or has diabetes or whatever it may be is not going to be another billion dollar building. Now, they may want to remodel some of the ones they have. That's fine. And you can output, you know, make every room have telehealth in it. I'm, I'm OK with that. But the reality is I think that distributed care model is, mm -hmm. is the future. And if they're not making that transition now, all they're doing, you're going to see this model where every hospital 10, 15 years from now is going out of business because they're trying to pay for these expansive campuses they've built that have no people in them. Right. Uh, like the blockbusters of today, mm -hmm. sure. we're down to one, I think. There's still one in Alaska <laughs> somewhere that's holding on for dear life, but uh, that's what's going to happen if they don't start moving now. 
So to his point, and I want to offer a great investment opportunity for you guys. <laughs> so Ross Perot Jr. is buying golf courses, which are largely flat, and it turns out golf courses aren't as popular because everyone's riding bikes these days and you need too much water. And he's building condos on golf courses and making a vast sum of money repurposing this thing that's kind of archaic. So the WeWork model not going to work so well, but what do you say we rebuild virtualist centers in what were formerly known as hospitals? I was going to make the exact same statement, not knowing that you're going to talk about the golf course. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the hospitals as they are today, the buildings, you know, to the point that Mike said, are not going to make the ROI. It's, it's just not going to get there. However, if we actually rethink about the hospitals as excellent centers, and we allow them to manage the care in their disciplines at a geography that is much larger than where they treat today, they may have a second life. If you think about, you know, God forbid if we all had cancer, um, we would love for our care, even if it's locally delivered, to be coordinated mm -hmm. by the right oncologist with the moral soul kinder. Or, you know, we would love for our, our uh, you know, the, the way we manage an endocrine disease to be managed by a Mayo Clinic specialist that's there. This means mm -hmm. that those kind of knowledge centers are going to become network operation centers. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be rendering the coordination of care through the local supply that is next to where I live. But the care coordination is going to come virtually to the places that have the best knowledge. By the way, the other side effect of that, or the other kind of uh, upside of that, is that those areas or those hospitals that specialize in something are going to have an enormous case pool. So from a research standpoint, if most of the cancer is going to be handled by or coordinated, more the care of that cancer will be handled by a single center in the US, our knowledge is going to explode. Right. So here's this interesting point, and this is related to the physical buildings going away worry of these CEOs. If someone were to ask you, what's the address of Mayo Clinic? The answer is oh, mayo.org, <laughs> right? I mean, there's not a physical address that I would think. I, you know, it's just here. You know, it's continuous care. I can reach the virtualists 24 hours a day, be triaged if I need to be to a physical location. But the address of a hospital will actually become a blockbuster kind of question. The digital front door. Yeah. That's my guess. Now, I'm going to ask one last question before we open it up to the audience. And you guys don't know about this one. It's going to be very hard to answer. So I have people who tell me, oh, there's no possible way you can safely run telehealth because the difference between a cold and bubonic plague is not so much. You're going to just, you need that in-person gestalt, hands-on thing. Comments? Millions and millions of patients would say that you were wrong uh, at this point, right? Uh, this is certainly something that's been proven out over and over again. The reality is there are cases where that's true, and people will need to see that. But I think the vast majority, you know, you talked about the 50% in the middle. That's not the case. And instead, if we're taxing the healthcare system, where people don't show up for follow-up appointments, they don't get physicians to practice at the top of their license, they don't get access to the very best care available in that specialty, well, that's actually not delivering the best care either. And I think when we look at our industry and the things that we can do, we help on all of those fronts. We provide much better access. We get you to a much better specialist. We help make sure that that appointment wasn't missed. Uh, and all of those things ultimately do a lot more for the public health good and for individual good than insisting that every doctor goes, to, or every patient goes to an average doctor who may or may not be the best person uh, to take care of them. If you've got the bubonic plague, I'm sure you want to go see a specialist, right. but I think that just isn't the case when it comes to your average patient in the healthcare system. Right, so he raised this interesting point. I only raise this as sort of a controversial topic because you hear the naysayers out there saying, you know, buggy whips are good, right? You know, and, and so he, he is saying effectively this, it is far better if you have a mushroom problem for you to connect to my phone than to see any primary care doctor in America, right? Because chances are, I'll get it right. <laughs> Any comments you'd make on quality, safety, things you've seen along your yeah. journey? There, there are a couple important points. One, there's this, this fallacy about comparing to the office. This is the National Quality Foundation did a great white paper about two years ago. Um, and what they said was, like, it is so wrong to try and compare the quality of a telehealth visit to an office visit. 
what you have to compare it to is what often would have happened if you didn't do that telehealth <coughs> visit, which is either delayed or no care at all you know, until it's too late. Um, and so, you know, it's the maybe non-delicate way of saying something's better than nothing, but we have people every day who come to all of us who would not go or would have significantly delayed care. Um, we have more and more people calling us from their cars. Why? Because that's the only time they have in their lives to squeeze in a little health care. They work jobs that they can't leave. They've got families to take care of. They have a little time to take care of their health, 30 minute commute, and that's when they're calling us. And you know, we have to really be much more sympathetic to the access problems that we have and the fact that we simply don't have enough. I often say we don't have a doctor shortage as much as we have a shortage of using doctors efficiently. And the truth is online care can and should be scalable. It's, you know, it's a combination of synchronous, asynchronous, um, automation, chatbots, et cetera. We have people come in and work with our chatbot before they even get to a doctor. And by doing that, one, by the way, that chatbot's probably going to always ask a question. Doctor won't always ask a question. Um, two, there's no evidence necessarily that being in the office and doing a physical exam um, in a lot of these cases makes a significant difference. There's very scant evidence on that. And some of us you know, who practice know, you know it's, it's, if someone has a problem, they're usually going to point to it. And part of our job, even telehealth, is to triage patients to the appropriate level of care if we think something else is going on. Um, but the truth is, it brings access to a lot of people who simply don't have it um, and can prevent problems before they get worse. So I'm, so I'm a big advocate when those pe people bring that up of saying, well, you look at the alternative uh, and it's much worse these days. All right, so he's brought up this really important point of access. And so two issues there is, um, I do some work with the Gates Foundation in Northern India and in Africa. Try getting access to a specialist if you're in Northern India. You know, it's just not gonna work so well, but yet, they're using Huawei phones over 4G connections in rural neighborhoods to bring you a appropriate specialist when needed without having to travel or wait. And then the other thing is, if you were to ask for an appointment with a Harvard specialist, any idea just generically how long you're going to be waiting? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you one other analogy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the answer is yeah, about two and, two and a half months. Yeah. Another analogy is when people say, oh, you know, I got to listen to their lungs. I'm like, well, really, that's not that great. Well, shouldn't we just do a chest X on everyone who comes in with a cough? Or really, maybe a CAT scan or maybe a PET scan. Like, yeah. at what level do you stop? Yeah. And so it's a, you know, again, a false argument to sort of say that, you know, telehealth alone isn't as good as the office visit because the office visit isn't as good as an ER visit or hospitalization or an open lung biopsy. Uh, if you if you believe that, sure. Analogy. Just cut them all open. Yeah. yeah. So, John, any quality safety really sure. comments? <laughs> yeah. Just to follow along with that, I agree. I mean, I think that most people who are, you know, if they're practicing physician, you probably would would would, uh, would say the stethoscope, mm -hmm. although I use it, has limited value mm -hmm. for me because I'm going to get a chest X-ray, right? Even if you have a broken arm, mm -hmm. the, the orthopedist is going to get an X-ray, right? Or if you're going to you do lap or lap tests. So I think telehealth falls into line with that, where we are essentially, like you said, we're we're going to triage these people, put them in the right category. And whether it's something you know is hyperacute or acute or subacute or whatever it is that mm -hmm. we, we treasure appropriately and put them in the right spot so they get in the care when they need it, how they need it, and they're getting the access to help them get the care at the right time. Because at least in the United States, again, you know, technology with imaging and lab and all these sorts of things, you know, overrides any sort of touch and feel that anybody does. So um, you know, conceptually people may feel, hey, you know, I've got to touch the patient, or patients may feel, well, the doctor has to touch me. The reality is most doctors would tell them, probably all of them would tell them that. That touch is kind of, I do it, but I'll never act upon it. And so, again, I'm going to say something very controversial. I am a physician. The physical exam and its positive predictive value ain't so good. <laughs> and so today, okay, Lyle's an MD. If I give you a stethoscope right now, could you hear that S3 rub on Roy? It's like, oh, I remember 25 years ago when I was in a medical situation, <laughs> what an S3 rub is. I haven't listened to one in 25 years. Even if you couldn't hear it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, sure. yeah, well, what if, in fact, um, because we're so consumerizing these devices, right? I got blood pressure cups and bathroom scales and pulse oximeters and glucometers and all these other things in my home for cheap. It's not in the so distant future that you're going to have wearable small echo devices that you're just going to strap on. Your, oh, okay, I see your ejection fraction is, <laughs> right? I mean, already in Israel, get to back to Israel, there are fetal monitors that you can just wear on a belt and it will do a full fetal ultrasound exam from your belt. <laughs> so comments on quality and safety. Yeah, I, 
I think that we've, we've arrived at the point in time in telehealth where I think this question is no longer necessary. We fought this for 10, 12 years to prove that telehealth was safe, that you could deliver meaningful healthcare over technology, and I think that ship has sailed. I don't think that anybody's debating this anymore. There are, as you said, there are industries that are forming to help the remote clinician get the information they need to care, whether it's you know, the, the ultrasound or the title device or, or the, the scale that gets to the parametric data or the home monitoring devices that can do that. I think the ship about whether this is safe medicine or not has sailed. I think the other question, or, or maybe the, 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 the analogy, and we're just kind of using an analogy to explain this, you know, what was the effect of, of text messaging on our ability to conduct relations? Total destruction of, te of, of romantic <laughs> relationships. Well, so, I can tell you that I, sometimes I share that opinion, <laughs> and sometimes I would, I would argue that that allows us to be much more connected, much more right. close. Instead of saying bye bye and meet again at like 8 o'clock in the evening, we actually get connected right. through the day. I think that there is a positive and negative in the way that we reinvent the way that we communicate. I think there's going to be bad apples that will abuse it. I think there are going to be unbelievable applications that are going to make healthcare a completely different kind of world. But I think we need to learn a lesson of the fact that introducing a new modality for a way something is done is not the culprit. Right. It's the people on both ends. And of course, I'm just joking with him, but it's fascinating because my mom, who's 81, grew up in the Smith Corona, you typed a letter, it took two weeks to go across the coast. I grew up in more the fax machine generation. My daughter, of course, is in the texting generation. And then beyond her, it's the Snapchat. You know, so, so we're all getting to different communication modalities. I just worry about what it's doing to our brains. But other than that, yeah. <laughs> We have five minutes left. Let me open it up to you folks. You know, these are the titans of our industry. So please, you know, questions, thoughts. Yes. Hi, I'm Carol Robbins from Peter Bridge Group. I have two questions. One, in terms of telehealth, um, can you describe a little bit about how you are accessing um, a patient's record or if you ever have the opportunity to out of health information exchange um, data tropes, and then the second is around how you're managing patient consent across, um, you know, the various state to state regulatory environments. Any any so comments? Very very quick answers. Um, in terms of patient consent and state by state, we, we abide by the law, right? I mean, the law actually is very clear about what consent has to be acquired. Um, what determines eligibility, both by way of coverage, but very important by way of licensure and credentialing, and we literally had to code capabilities into our products that make it a no-brainer. I mean, this is the way it works. You will not be able to see on any one of our systems someone who is not right for you or not ready to deliver care for you, and the consent is being acquired. From a medical record standpoint, we can't fix everything. I mean, we, we, we go for because these are national systems, we actually hone in on things that are ubiquitously available. For example, we're much better at getting the medication list for a patient from the likes of Showscripts than we are getting a medical record that was created in some kind of practice. Uh, in the cases where it's unavailable, we tell the clinician that it's unavailable and they do what they do in the office. The patient came in, no record available, they need to do a different kind of workup for that patient to create comfort in treatment. Yeah, we're, so, and the consent part, yes, I mean, it's, you know, we, we're very careful about that. On the um, records, you know, we, of course, have our own ability for patients to put in their records. Sometimes they're good at that, sometimes not. Uh, if we're working with a health system, we'll often do CCD, fire, or some type of um, uh, data sharing uh, both ways, so we have some of that. Uh, and then uh, for our health plans now, they're starting to also send us a CCD, which will summarize as a PDF, but also will start pulling in discrete data um, that the uh, patient or the doctor can change, right? So now we've got the medication that they've pulled in, and, um, and similarly, we're starting to work with SureScripts to pull some of that. So it's like a lot, and we're also, we have some work with some data, some HIEs, et cetera. So it depends a bit on the particular client, although we're starting to look at some of the national players as well to get the data. And then share the data, we always ask the patient if they want 
their, um, their information shared with the primary care doctor, of which you know, we have a record. We basically wind up in, unless it's, we have a relationship with the health system, we're faxing that because that's the standard these days, but at least it's something. And then the, the patient also has the ability to download the summary of their record and bring it in. So what you've heard is we kind of do what we must, but as we see the evolution of networks like Commonwealth and care equality, you know, there'll be more generalizable ways to get this. And my favorite model, not going to work for everybody for sure, is that as you look at the notices of proposed rulemaking from February of 2019, Basically, it says every doctor in every hospital has to have an API available that grants to the patient full access to at least their basic medical record so that the patient could receive it and share it, or the patient could delegate the sharing of it. But it's the consent issues sort of go away a bit if the patient says, I'm going to delegate to you to get my record from this API. And we'll watch how that rule evolves because it could help you all. Well, I think one last question. Yes. My name is Matt Rose. I'm actually a physician as well as uh, with, with Saba. Uh, with the physician shortage, AMC predicts that there's going to be a 46,000 to a 90,000 uh, person or physician shortage by 2025. Do you think that what you're building with telehealth can reduce the RBU time required in order to maximize the number of patients that are seen and hopefully address that issue? Or are we still having to? I think it can certainly help. I mean, I, I think telehealth does a great job in helping get a doctor to practice at the top of their license or another provider. So for example, there's a lot of things you can do with a nurse practitioner uh, over telehealth. And I think there's a lot of things we can do to speed along that visit. Uh, we're working on lots of concepts around AI where a patient in a waiting room can do a lot of the work and sort of pre-triage to make that a very efficient and yet very impactful visit, all of which will ultimately help uh, some of the utilization of our, of our providers. Uh, so there are a number of things that telehealth can do to help with that. Yeah, and, and let's be clear, I mean, our online, our system is broken. There's no future where we can make enough doctors to continue our current system, and that's, yeah, you know, it's just not happening. So we all have to figure a way to scale this, like I said, we have less, of, there's not a shortage of physicians as much as a shortage of using them efficiently. It's like saying there's a shortage of vice presidents of banks. If we made every vice president of the bank you know, be the person who gives you your change, that's what we've done with doctors. Um, so uh, using you know, automation, chatbot, um, self-service, what every other industry has, that's what we have to think about. So we're not, we shouldn't be looked at as companies that are simply, again, trying to put a doctor online to do a 15 minute, you know, face you know, video visit, that's not gonna be scalable and solve what we need. And there are instances on the high end where you really need that specialist to do that time, but also in that lower end, in that big chunk of 50, 75% of Americans who have routine repeatable care, we have to figure out how to automate as much as possible and only bring in the doctor. So yes, that those virtualists will be able to see not a panel size of 2,000, but imagine five or 10 or 20,000 patients um, by using this technology. And then the complexologist will have a panel size that's maybe 500. That's, that's a load balancing that is the, that's where I'm skating to where that puck's going and thinking about it. John, it looks like I you had a commitment. You're, it's, you know, it's that funnel, right? You have the, these patients that are gonna funnel through, you have the virtualist like you described, mm -hmm. and it goes down to, you know, if it's a complex case, it'll get funneled down to that specialist who's a mushroom mm -hmm. person mm -hmm. who can manage the, the mushroom case uh, here mm -hmm. and, and kind of triage accordingly. But um, I think that's the way to evolve. I think there's just one other, <clears throat> one other thing that we don't think about. We, we always think about telehealth on the consuming part, on the patient part, and the availability of services to them. What we tend to forget is that this is going to have fundamental impact on the lifestyle of clinicians as well. And we've seen in places like Hawaii, when we rolled the system there, where clinicians who were burnt out, who didn't want to do this, didn't want to hold the practice, didn't want to handle the endless negotiation with the payers for fees and everything else, and said, when I'm not going to hold a practice, I actually love treating patients. And I'm going to make myself available for a couple of hours every day from home. And we've seen, we've seen a lot of physicians who were out of the business come back. I don't think that there's a single thing that we can do to change the supply of medical services than to bring back a lot of the clinicians that in some shape or form are on the sideline, maybe because they are 
you know, they have a young family, maybe because they're burnt out, maybe because they're retired. And I think telehealth is going to make a significant, the opposite of dent, kind of the positive dent of bringing those cycles back into the pool, at least at the short term. And I would agree with everything they've said. There is an Israeli company, always an Israeli company, working on ways for healthcare. The shortest distance to wellness for you right now is X taking you to the person who's practicing at the top of their license for the issue that you have. And that's, it's as you all have said, it's better triage and better utilization of a limited supply. Well, thanks so much to these titans. Wonderful conversation. The 2019 Converge to Accelerate conference is brought to you by IEEE, the world's largest technical professional organization for the advancement of technology. Bollinger Ingelheim, passionately working to improve healthcare. NASCO, advancing digital health together.